Ashland attention. Uh, I'm going to try to sort of spend the first part of our, our time talking about sort of the theory of rational inattention, this being a theory summer school. Uh, and then in the second half, I'd like to talk about how it's been applied in finance and try to suggest some places where it has yet to be applied in finance, but might fruitfully be applied uh, by someone, perhaps you, in the future. And, uh, so I should say, please uh, ask me questions. Uh, I'm going to go over some fairly technical material. And uh, I might go over it pretty quickly unless uh, you slow me down so that we all are on the same page. So what is rational inattention? So Chris Sims introduced this idea uh, into the economics literature in a series of papers. And the basic idea is that agents have a limited ability to acquire or process information that is compared to a situation where they have full information about the environment and the payoffs, uh, rational inattention says, no, 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 their ability to learn about the situation that facing them is limited. But that said, they do get to choose both how much information to acquire and what kind of information to acquire. So in this sense, it is endogenizing the information that an agent will have when making a decision in a very flexible way. That is, it's not just like buy a signal or don't buy a signal. It's I can buy any signal I want at some cost. And so that's the paradigm. Now, why is this important in finance? That's what I'm going to sort of argue for you. Asymmetric information is everywhere in finance. Hopefully, I do not have to convince you that asymmetric information is important. It's important in primary markets. When companies sell securities to investors, they may have more information than the investors about their future prospects. It's important in secondary markets. Different people trading in the market for an asset might have different information. So this, I think, is well established. But it's well established in the context of models where information itself is exogenous. That is. People are endowed with different information, and this allows them to take advantage of others or be taken advantage of others or make better or worse decisions. But I think that's missing something important. What kind of information and how much information people have when they participate in these markets is a function of their incentives to gather information. That is, there is a two-way dialogue here. The operation of the market depends on who has what information. But who has what information is going to depend on their incentives to acquire information looking ahead to how that market is going to operate. And you are going to miss this two-way interaction unless you think about endogenizing information acquisition. And that's what the theory of rational intention allows us to do. One second, Eric. It allows us to explore this interaction between financial markets and who, who has what information. So, imagine that agents were perfectly rational, uh, no limit to how much information they could acquire, but they they could uh, they could only acquire it with a cost. Uh, that would enable you seems to do the same sort of two-way interaction, but there's no, uh, there's no inattention. Well, so this is a great question. So it's, it gets to something uh, I'm going to talk about in a slide or two. But there are multiple interpretations of what's going on here. One interpretation, which was the interpretation advocated originally by Sims, is that this inattention is a cognitive limitation. You or I just cannot possibly pay attention to all of the things that matter for our economic decisions. So we try to focus on the things that are most important and neglect the details. There's a second interpretation here, which is, no, no, no. You or I have full ability in our brains to process all of the relevant information, but acquiring information costs time and money. I don't think you actually need to take a stand on which of those two interpretations you adopt in order to use this theory. So when I say rational attention, I am not 
arguing specifically that it is the cognitive limitation rather than a cost of information, I'm going to sort of lump those two things together. And I'll talk about that in just a sec. Jose? But what's different, I, I do think that Sims has a contribution, especially on the cognitive side. You know, papers in which it's costly to acquire information have, have been written. It's, uh, papers where people say, well, it's costly to, to observe a signal. That's how many people are going to observe it. That's right. How bad is the thing going to become? How but there's two things that Sim intru Sims introduced. One is this idea that you can acquire any kind and quantity of information you want to. And so relative to the existing literature, that's a big increase in this kind of flexibility. The second aspect of what Sims introduced is a behavioral argument that these limits are cognitive limits. I don't think you need to take the second argument on board to think that the first idea that there's really a great deal of choice about what kind of information to spend your time acquiring is an important idea. So I think both of those were Sims's contributions. You don't necessarily have to take both of them. But, but, it, but is, is the first assumption really accurate? I mean, say say uh, I'm, a, I'm a artisan and I've, I've made a, a, a beautiful pot. I know what I put into this pot. There's, there's no way that you're, you're going to know as much about that pot as I am, no matter how much time you spend. Well, that's right. So there may be limits. I think the right way to capture that kind of limit is to say that there are very high costs of getting nearly perfect information. Whether we ever take the stance that truly perfect information is or is not feasible is not going to be super important for what we're going to do. We're going to operate in the range where even if you spend a lot of effort, you will not have perfect information. And so we don't need to take a strong stand on that. One dimension is that we've been overlooked and we need to have the reason is the time dimension. Uh, so change this iPhone in no time. You give me money, you give me... I, I will... The knowledge how to operate that, you have to take less from here, less than that may take an hour, two hours and longer. So I will argue that that has not been overlooked. Uh, in particular in my own work, so you have given me an opportunity to advertise my paper with Mike Woodford, which provides a dynamic interpretation of these models in which the costs are actually the amount of time involved to study something. But that's way too advanced for what we're going to do right now. I want to start by understanding what the basic theory is, uh, and then we can talk about these different interpretations. So one is cognitive limits. We've talked about that. An alternative is that some information just costs money. It takes time and effort to, or money to buy data, run surveys, stuff like that. Yet a third interpretation is that organizations, which we often treat of as single agents, are in fact not single agents. And the communication frictions inside an organization might be somewhat analogous to a cognitive friction within a unitary agent. I don't really care how you think about it. There are many interpretations here. But they're all going to have the same mathematical framework. What is going to be important is what we take ourselves as the outside economists as understanding. So I want to ask the question, is rational inattention behavioral? Well, yes, if you compare a rationally inattentive agent to the behavior of an agent who has full information. Yes when you think of yourself as having full information, and then you look at a rationally and attentive agent's behavior, and you say, oh, look, they are failing to take advantage of some information that is available. So one application of rational inattention is this Koybion and Gorodnichenko papers, which talk about predictable forecast errors in like the uh, survey of professional forecasters and other kinds of surveys. These are professional forecasters. Their errors should not be predictable by past information. If they are truly offering forecasts, it turns out that they are predictable. You can think about that in rational inattention, in the language of rational inattention. But what you're saying there is that you, the economist, see all these past variables and can incorporate them into your model. But these professional forecasters, for some reason, don't or do so only imperfectly and don't know can't incorporate that information. However, there's also a non-behavioral interpretation. 
that's where you say, no, no, no. These agents are learning as much as they can given the available technology and constraints. I, as the economist, don't know anything more than they know. So I'm going to take their information as unobservable to me, but assume they're doing the best they can given whatever information they have. So there's a non-behavioral interpretation there. And in many ways, that choice behavior is just as if they were receiving exogenous signals, except that when you change their incentives, they will suddenly have different information. The information responds to the incentives. And that's the key contribution. Yeah. That's right. So there definitely are implications. Another is whether you think of this cost of information as being welfare relevant or not. Right? Like, is making the situation more complex for the agents a direct utility cost? Or is it a constraint that they face, but not, doesn't actually cause them disutility? There are situations where your interpretation here matters. That's absolutely right. Uh, so we can either think, I'm making the best decisions I can, given the information I can afford to acquire. Or we can think, I am ignoring information because it is too mentally costly for me to process it all. In my mind, there are some differences between these things, but not a huge amount. So I don't think we really need to take a stand. Uh, you're on. One feature of a lot of the forecast data is pretty large amount of diversion and heterogeneity. Um, so what's your interpretation or view on thinking about heterogeneity? That's a, a great question. So and you'll see that in the context of rational and attention theory, it turns out to be a very advanced question. Almost everything that I'm going to do for you is in the context of a single agent. It could be that people make uncorrelated or IID rational and attention mistakes, in which case you will get a distribution. Maybe it will look like the ones in the data that Euron is referring to. It could be that people make correlated or systematic mistakes. You have to take a stand on that, and that's a little bit outside of the existing rational and attention theory. So I'll try to mention, uh, you know, in two hours, uh, I'll try to come back to this issue a little bit. But it's a little advanced for where we are right now. So the original rational and attention papers were due to Chris Sims. He wrote a, a survey in 2010, but this literature really boomed sort of in the last decade. There's been a recent survey by Mikoyak, Mateka, and Wiederholt, all of whom have been major contributors to this literature in the JEL. I strongly recommend it if you're interested in this topic. And of course, I'm going to mention many papers uh, in the slides that follow. OK, so let's get started. So x is going to be a set of states of nature. Uh, it could be a finite set. That's how I'm going to sort of think about it. It could be infinite. Um, a is going to be a set of feasible actions that an agent can take. I'm going to assume compactness, except when I don't, and I'll be specific about that. But in general, I want to avoid sort of worrying about taking infinite actions. So an agent is going to take an action A, and the state is going to be x, and that is going to give the agent utility u of ax. So you're probably used to utility functions. You could call this a state-dependent utility function. There are many examples of taking actions. Um, so in finance, we might take a, accept a take-it-or-leave-it offer to buy something. That will be one of our examples. We might make a portfolio, an asset allocation decision. That will be another example. We might choose to sell or not sell an asset at the current market price. Uh, we might make an investment where we mo both have to decide yes, no, or maybe we also have a quantity choice. These are all actions. So these are the actions we're taking. This would be reflecting the monetary payoff, but perhaps also the curvature in our utility function or whatever else is going on. So if you know x, this problem is very simple. You choose an action which is a maximizer. I get to write max because of that compactness decision. 
uh, that maximizes your utility. This is uh, the simplest model. You're probably familiar with it. Um, but now let's suppose that we don't exactly know x. Well, if we have beliefs q, which are an element of a probability simplex, that's what I'll mean by this script p. So x is the set of states of nature. Script p is saying probability simplex on that. Uh, I'm going to assume that these things are elements of Rx positive, that is their positive measures, where Qx, the element associated with the state x, is just the probability of x. This is to say I am giving myself a coordinate system on this probability simplex. You could pick any arbitrary coordinate system. This is obviously the most obvious one. Just each of these things is a number, which is the probability of that state. They have to add up to 1, being probabilities. So the agent is now going to maximize her expected utility. So now we choose an action, given our belief, that maximizes the sum of probabilities times payoffs. So ua here is now a vector. Q is a vector. I'm taking the dot product. That's just the expected utility. So <laughs> agents maximize utility, but when they don't know what's going on, they maximize expected utility. So, so far, we haven't done anything. You all know this. OK. But now let's suppose that these beliefs, that Q, didn't just sort of fall from the sky. It is the posterior after the agent observed a signal. So let's say that S, little s, is a signal realization in big S, which is a set of possible signal realizations. And let QS be the posterior beliefs on X after you observe the realization little s. So you see this little s, QS is now your beliefs. In that case, again, you will maximize your expected utility. But now we recognize that this is a posterior. And the optimal action is a function of the signal you receive rather than being an arbitrary function on the simplex. I'll just point out, because this is a single agent decision problem, there's no kind of time consistency issue here, right? We could choose this AS function before we know what S is, or we could just choose A after seeing S. We're just maximizing utility, so it doesn't matter. If we were playing a game, on the other hand, where there were other people involved, this could get more complicated. Related to that, there's no reason to randomize. I can just say, well, pick one of these actions. But of course, if multiple actions are optimal, you can weakly randomize. And maybe if you were playing a game, you would want to randomize. But single agent decision problems, no reason to think about that. OK, so where do those posteriors come from, those QSs? Well, they come from Bayes' rule. So if QS is a posterior, we can use Bayes' rule and think about probabilities of receiving signals conditional on states. So let PSX be the probability we have this signal realization, little s, in this state x. And let Q0 be our prior beliefs. That means that under those prior beliefs, we believe the unconditional probability pi s of receiving the signal s is the sum over the states of the world of the probability of that state times the probability of s conditional on that state. The posterior beliefs are given by Bayes' rule, at least when we're receiving a signal we think can happen. And that's just probability of s given x, probability x over probability s. That is just literally Bayes' rule. I will point out something. This PSX and Q0 and this pi s and QS are sort of equivalent ways of representing what can happen in terms of information. That is, given any pi and set of posteriors such that they go to this prior, I can find a P that will generate those posteriors through Bayes' rule. That is, the prior and the P 
and the pi and the posteriors are one to one. I can go back and forth between these two things. You will often see people doing this in rational inattention problems. So don't be confused. They're just reformulating their choice variables to be whatever is convenient. Okay. This thing P, the conditional probability of receiving a signal S given state X, is a collection of probability distributions on S for each X. And that is what I'm going to call a signal structure. S, the big S, is the signal alphabet. Signal alphabets don't really mean anything. What do I mean by that? Could be left, right, red, green, 1, 2, 37, 241. These are all alphabets with two possible realizations. The particular things in these sets have no intrinsic meaning. What do I mean by that? Let's suppose that phi is a mapping between one alphabet to a different alphabet, S prime, and suppose it's invertible. That is, I can also invert it and go from S prime to S. Then I can just define a new signal structure by running it through that mapping. And it's really identical in terms of the information content. And what I mean by that is that the sets of posteriors are identical. And moreover, the distribution over posteriors, that is the probability that I get each posterior, is also identical. So these things have no meaning. You can label them however you want. OK. So now let's think about an agent who gets one of these signal structures exogenously. That is, they're just given this signal structure. Then they get to observe a realization and take an action. So we, give, we get their prior. We get their signal alphabet. And p, we just take that as given. Applying Bayes' rule, we can get a pi and a qs. Now we come up with a choice rule that maps realizations from signal realizations to actions to maximize expected utility. So our expected utility is the probability of getting each signal. And then the expected payoff conditional on that signal under the optimal action for that signal. Equivalently, it's the probability of a state times the distribution of signals conditional on that state times the utility of whatever action we take in that state and that state's uh, effect on the payoff. So maximize expected utility given our exogenous signal structure. So now we need to talk about something called Blackwell's theorem. So suppose we have another one of these mappings from, phi, from S, a signal alphabet, to S prime. But suppose, rather than being invertible, that this time it is a random mapping or a Markov mapping. That is, it takes each of these, and with some probability, it garbles them into one of those. Indeed, the phi is known in this context as a garbling matrix. When I scramble your information, it makes it harder for you to make a good decision. The value function under the scrambled information is weakly less than the value function under the original information. And so the key idea here is that garbling leads to more sort of dense, less spread out posteriors. And having spread out posteriors helps you make better decisions. So you don't like garbling. Okay. Now, let's start endogenizing the choice of signal structure. So in that last slide, we just got that P. Now we're going to have a choice. Suppose the P, we can either get it and pay some cost C or not. This, by the way, is very popular in some seminal papers in finance. If you go back to Grossman Stiglitz, 1980, or Dan Gorton Holmstrom, which is a beautiful security design paper, 
There, you either buy the signal or you don't. If you buy the signal, you then get to take an action which is conditional on the signal. So you're going to do better here, but you have to pay the cost for the signal. If you don't buy the signal, you just take whatever action is best under your prior. You don't get to update your information. So obviously, if the cost was zero, you would always buy. As the cost grows large relative to your utility function, you'll never buy. If the particular signal that you're offered is not informative about what action you should take, you will never buy it. The purpose of buying the signal is to take different actions depending on the signal's realization. If you are taking the same action regardless of the signal, then by Bayes' rule, this thing just sums to your prior, you're better off taking the prior and not buying it. So the key point here is that with an expected utility agent, you only learn because it helps you make better actions. That is not true for certain non-standard preferences. If you have a preference for the early resolution of uncertainty, uh, so if you understand the words that I'm using, that's related to Epstein's in preferences, or if you have a robust control type preference of the sort that Hansen and Sargent have thought about, you like information for its own sake. Even if it doesn't change your action, you would like to know. So the we have embedded an expected utility assumption here. I don't think expected utility is crazy, but it is an assumption. And it is meaning that these agents don't really care about knowing things that are irrelevant to their action. They only want to know about their action. I will also point out that this cost was additively separable, the way I wrote it. That's going to be true in my rational and attention model that's going to come soon. I am not aware of any justifications or any research that has talked about whether additive separability is a good assumption or not. You could think, for example, about trying to think about rational attention costs from like a balanced growth preferences perspective. I have never seen anyone do that, and I have no idea what would happen. I am merely pointing out that there is an assumption that everyone makes and no one discusses. Okay. In that discrete signal choice problem, there was no choice about what kind of information or how much information to acquire. You either got it or you didn't. Maybe the agent wants some information, but not the kind of information that was being offered on the previous slide. So what rational intention does is it says, you can choose any signal structure, any P, at a cost. So I'm going to write the problem conditional on a signal alphabet, S, for a second. I get to choose now my P in addition to my action to maximize my expected utility minus an additively separable information cost function. On the previous slide, C was just a constant. It was the cost of one signal structure. Now we need something that is going to assign a cost to all possible p. And this is going to be called the cost function. The grand problem here also includes a choice of signal alphabet. But I'm going to get rid of that on the next slide. So I don't want to try to write it in full generality. Are there any questions about this? This is rational and attention. Yes. So these things come from the Bayes rule on this. Yeah. Does it imply that there is multiple things so that they people choose uh, the action on the second on day two and they choose the information? I don't know. I mean, this was sort of related to the earlier question. You can think about this as happening sort of instantaneously. You can think about it as happening over time. Uh, I don't have a strong feeling about that. 
Um, there are people who have dynamic versions of this model where that's all explicitly spelled out. This is a static model. You know, it's like when you go in a static consumption problem and you buy apples and oranges, do you literally eat the apples and oranges at the same time or not? I don't know, right? That's not how I think about it. Yeah. We are, so uh, the name of my game, as opposed to what Sims, so Sims plugged in a functional form here. Uh, a lot of my research has been about how to avoid doing that. So I'm gonna try at least to think about this in its generality. Um, and what can we say if we don't say anything about this? What can we say if we say a little bit about it, but not everything? Okay. So now we have to think about this choice of the signal alphabet, the big S. And what I'm going to assume is that our cost function is Blackwell monotone. So what does that mean? Well, let's let phi be one of those Markov mappings or garbling matrices. And let P prime be the signal structure induced when we apply the phi to the P. I'm going to say the cost under the garbled signal structure is weakly less than the cost under the original signal structure. In other words, Blackwell less informative cost functions are always weakly less costly. This ordering of Blackwell monotonicity is a very incomplete ordering. Most signal structures cannot be said to dominate the other. But when you have something that is just clearly more informative, I'm going to assume it's more costly. It turns out this might not even really be an assumption. Suppose it was not true. If you could do your own mental garbling, you could generate the P prime and the S by getting the P and the S and garbling it yourself. So if you have the ability in your own mind to confuse yourself, then um, this is probably without loss of generality. So it seems like a weak assumption. A consequence, however, is that it is without loss of generality to suppose that our set of signals is the same as our set of actions, which seems like a striking result. But the point is that if S is, has a higher cardinality than A, then that must mean that two different realizations are leading to the same optimal action. I think that's called the pigeonhole principle, if I remember my analysis. Uh, so you could just garble things and merge those two into the same action. You'd pay less information cost and get the same utility. If for some reason you had a signal alphabet optimally that was smaller in cardinality than the set of possible actions, you can always just split one and make the thing totally uninformative in terms of the split, just split it randomly, and now you're back up. This last thing, by the way, is connected to a general idea called invariance. Okay, and then obviously, once we have cardinality of S equal to cardinality of A, I talked about how the labels in S don't matter, they don't mean anything, so we might as well just make each of them correspond to an A. So, No, so if we split by using an invertible Markov mapping, its inverse is also a Markov mapping. And so P, S, greater than equal, P prime, S prime, greater than equal, they must be the same. Now this stuff is, it, the vocabulary here is confusing. The ideas, I don't know. You can decide if they're deep or obvious, or maybe some mixture thereof. Yeah. You're, you're going to need to speak louder.
Ah, this is a great question. So what you are noticing, just to repeat for everyone else, is that this cost, in theory, could depend on my prior belief. So if Jose and I believe different things, but we choose the same P, it looks like it might assign us different costs. One of my papers is about exactly your observation that maybe this is not a good idea. However, the standard cost functions that people use in the literature have this property. That Jose and I, with our different Q zeros, choosing the same P, pay different costs. Uh, so you're right, that's weird. Uh, obviously, including it as an argument doesn't mean it actually matters. So what you're talking about is a special case of this formalism. But you're right, it could be weird. Um, Absolutely. So Sims's original defense of this was that, no, 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 it may be harder for Jose to move his beliefs more than it would be for me. So if the signal structure is more informative for Jose, it may be more mentally costly for him to learn it than it is for me, even if our realizations are the same. So that, that is exactly the argument that Sims made. You can buy it or not. I don't have a strong feeling. Uh, okay, so now we've gotten rid of the S, and we have A. So you'll notice here, this used to be script P of S, simplex on S. Now it's script P on A. We're talking about simplexes over actions. The other thing to note is that be because we've equated signals and actions, we might as well just assume that you take the action associated with the signal. That is, the signals are recommended actions, and you do that action. I don't want to go with you, but if we're talking about mental costs, and this transition from signals to actions might involve a fair amount of mental costs. There might be a set of signals there. So if you... If you buy this Blackwell monotone thing, then you're stuck with this result. I don't buy it. All right, then. I don't buy it. If it's true that if something is a problem, then it's more costly. But then you're making then an you argument. Want to use it, maybe. Well, but, but then what? It would involve a, a, serious, a considerable mental act. I don't know. It's I mean, it seems to me like you can self garble. So I tend to think of the Blackwell thing as very innocuous. Uh, it does have this implication. Now, it doesn't mean that you're not thinking very hard about this problem, right? You and know, you <coughs> talked about mental costs. Yeah. So we should, there is a mental cost here, which you might say. I don't know. You don't assign a cost. But moving from a signal to the action well, might involve a considerable... I think you're interpreting this not as a prediction about behavior, but rather as literally what is going on in someone's brain. And if you want to interpret it literally as what is going on in someone's brain, I think you need a lot more formalism here to think about inside this C. I have a paper that is moving in that direction, but I don't think now is the right time to talk about that. So um, I'm going to move on. But yeah, I think I, I'm very sympathetic to what you're saying. Your interpretation here may matter. Yeah. Uh, could just say that are not yeah, so wha one possibility is that for some P's, the cost is infinity. I haven't said it's differentiable or well-behaved or anything. Now, I'm going to impose that later, but if you want to say some things are just out, assign them an infinite cost. No, so there is an assumption here, which is that if... You, you're, yeah, you're right. The perfect signal must be infinitely costly if anything is infinitely costly. I don't find that to be too problematic, right? Because if something was infinitely costly but a perfect signal was not, you could just get the perfect signal and then confuse yourself, right? So I, I find that example weird to think about. But in general, there's no problem with having some things be infinity and Blackwell monotone, but any, everything more precise than an infinite cost has to be infinite. Um, okay, 
So remember, we could have uh, actions 1, 2, 3, 4. That could be signals 1, 2, 3, 4, each of which is corresponding to recommended action. It could be red, green, yellow, blue. Doesn't mean anything. Now I want to ask a question. Does this model have any predictions at all? All I've said about this is Blackwell monotone. So is there any behavior that could not fit into this framework? And the answer is yes, to some degree. There are some things that this agent has to do that could be ruled out in data. So what kind of data do you need? You need what Kaplan and Dean call state-dependent stochastic choice data. So you're going to observe many, and here I mean infinitely many, repetitions of an agent making the same decision. You know what action they take and what the true state was. You also need to observe the same problem for the agent, but on a restricted set of actions. That'll be this A0. It's a subset. And you need to know this for every possible A0. And finally, you need to know the utility. Although they argue that that's not a huge problem if you have all the rest of this data. Um, OK, so from this, you can get what they call the revealed posterior, given a set of actions available. What is that? It's the probability of x given that you take a particular action from the set of feasible actions. Because we have observed infinitely many repetitions, we can think about that as a probability. We have this revealed posterior. Obviously, we also get revealed unconditional action probabilities. Just what is the probability in the data that you take that action? So what are the predictions of the model? in its full glorious generality. There are two. No improving action switches. What does that mean? It means given a revealed posterior associated with some A prime action, it must indeed be better to do A prime than to do some other A that you could have done. Right? When I am choosing A prime, it must at least on average be a good idea. I can't be able to get a higher utility by choosing an action A under the revealed posterior of A prime. That is, given your information, you behave optimally. So that's one prediction of the model. The second prediction of the model is something called no improving attention cycles. Think about what this means. Let A0 and A1 be two different subsets of actions I could take. My expected utility when choosing from the A0 information and an A0 action plus my expected utility from choosing from the A1 information, my A1 action, has to be better than choosing A0 with the A1 information and A1 with the A0 information. That is, what we are contemplating is two different decision problems and saying, well, if I took the information from this but then picked the action and moved it over to this problem and the information from that and moved it over to that problem, I can't make myself better off. The cycles part is that you extend this argument beyond pairs A0, A1 to A0, A1, A2, A da da da, An. And you have a cycle. But so these are the two predictions. This one is I act optimally given my action. And this one, in some sense, is my information is optimally chosen. There's not some other decision problem whose information structure I could grab and do better in my problem. OK. So now we know that there are things that this theory predicts, but not much. Yeah. Yeah, so there are, these could be non-overlapping, for example. It's, it, you're right that it's related to that property of Blackwell monotonicity. But um, 
it's really quite a different property, although it can, you know, it's derived from that idea. Yeah. Well, remember, the, the whole point of this Kaplan and Dean paper is that you can imagine this as an experiment. You are offering people yeah, choices. No, no. So in their experiment, they have a screen which has a bunch of red and blue circles on it interspersed. And there are either 51 red and 49 blue or 49 red and 51 blue. And your task is to choose whether there are more red or more blue. That's what you're going to say. That's your action. And then you get a dollar payment for correct answers. That's your utility. And then you do that a bunch of times. And sometimes you make mistakes and sometimes you don't. And we get this data. And then we test whether these restrictions are satisfied in that experiment. And they find that they are. So that's the Kaplan and Dean paper. Um, so you're right, it's completely abstract. We haven't talked anything about finance yet. But this is a framework for thinking about how people make decisions when they have either imperfect information or imperfect perception. And we're seeing what is the content of this theory. And it turns out it has some content. Yes? It has content in the sense that Sam was saying the deal preference has content. This just seems to be the animal. That's right. To, to, uh, to, to, to cast the choice of Samuelson 1938. I think that's absolutely right. That there's not a lot of content, but there is, as it turns out, some content. So it could have been the case that in the Kaplan Dean experiment, this failed. It didn't, but it could have been. Okay. What else can we safely assume? Yeah. I know a little bit, yeah. That's a violation. Yeah, that's a violation of this, and the psychology seems to find a lot of that. Yeah. So is there any connection? Like, how, how do you think about it? Mm, that's a good question. I don't, I don't know off the top of my head. Well, that, that would violate. Right. I, that would certainly violate yeah. uh, these predictions. But I think, is there a reason why or something that... The reason why... No, 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 Can you explain to us what the matching is? Suppose there is... One way faster with 70% chance. And I should, uh, uh, rationally, you should always take the, uh, like, I-90s uh, that have 70% chance faster. But in practice, people behave as, like, that they take the faster route with 70% chance and take the slower route with 30% chance. Which is right. Yeah, so I, I, I think in that context, you want to be a little careful, right? So. If you assert that the agents have a prior probability that they know it's 70-30 and that there is no information they can gather, then it's clearly a violation. If you assert that their prior probability is 50-50 and they need to acquire this information that is in fact 70-30 and sometimes they will misperceive the information, then it very much fits with the rational and attention framework. So, when you, th when you think about these kinds of things in the context of experiments, you need to be extremely careful about what you think the agent's priors are. Right, but that's something that you can do yeah. in the experiment. In fact, the, this has been one of the, the, there are experiments with birds. Two levers, one pays off with 70% probability, the other 30% probability. The, the, the birds have lots of experience, and in the long run, Choose one lever 70% of the time, and the other. Yeah, so, so that would be a clear violation of this. If you assume that their prior has converged to the point that they understand these probabilities, a rationally inattentive bird cannot do that. Right? Yeah. So that would be an example of a prior not converging. So, right. I don't. I don't have any strong feelings about how restrictive these, these conditions are. These are the conditions of the general theory. So, yeah. I just want to do a question. The first is, like, if you can't do that, then you go to the conference and 
Yes. So I only know about, so my own work on that is in a stationary setting where the state is known not to be changing. In a non-stationary setting, I'm not sure I know what to say. I mean, I speculate uh, along the lines of your suggestion that in a non-stationary setting, you could get a sort of failure to converge on the prior. Um, if, you if it's truly stationary, but you have a prior that it's non-stationary, I don't know. Um, yeah, so I don't want to speculate, but yeah, those are interesting questions. Okay, what else can we safely assume? Well, let's assume that P tilde is the uninformative signal structure or an uninformative signal structure. The probabilities of reaching each signal are the same in each state. It conveys no information. By Blackwell monotonicity, that has to be the least costly thing. Without loss of generality, because we have uh, additive separability, I'm just going to set that to zero. That's just the level of utility thing. Doesn't mean anything. Mixture feasibility. Suppose we flip a weighted coin. With probability lambda, we get something from P1. With probability 1 minus lambda, we get something from P2. And we know the result of our coin flip. We're not confused. A natural assumption is that without loss of generality, the mixed signal structure is less costly weakly than the mixed strategy. Again, if you thought this inequality did not hold, you could just do a mixed strategy and replicate the results of this. Um, a lemma from one of my papers says if you have Blackwell monotonicity and mixture feasibility, if and only if you have Blackwell monotonicity and convexity of the cost function in P. Convexity of the cost function is our friend because now we're in the world of convex optimization. We so, need concave optimization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Concave maximization, yeah. So the convexity in P is extremely useful. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, so I'm going to make an additional assumption. Uh, nothing is free. So if you're not uninformative, you're strictly positive cost. A cost function is called posterior separable if it can be written as the sum of the probabilities of receiving each signal. Remember here I've written actions, but actions and signals are the same. This is really signals. Times a divergence between your prior and your posterior. What is a divergence? It is a function of two probability distributions such that it is strictly positive if they are not the same and zero if they are the same. You can think about it like a distance, but it fails some of the usual requirements of a distance. It might not be symmetric. It might not satisfy the triangle inequality. Uh, but it's sort of a, a pseudo distance. OK. By convexity and Blackwell monotonicity, this divergence has to be convex in its first argument. Again, that's going to make our lives easier. Kaplan, Dean, and Leahy have some axioms that characterize from behavior under what circumstances the cost has a posterior separable representation. These axioms are hard for me to understand, so I'm not going to attempt to teach you what they are. Um, I have a paper that says, well, if you give me continuous directional differentiability, which doesn't seem wildly demanding, but you know it is an extra assumption, then it turns out that to first order every cost function is posterior separable. So that's a result in one of my papers. So almost everyone in the literature looks at posterior separable, not general things. And we have some reasons for that, but honestly, it's just very hard to think about what's in here but not posterior separable.
Uh, no. <laughs> um, so the no forgetting constraint is a constraint in a dynamic setting. It's saying I can't take the information I had last period and, and sort of forget it to save on information cost this period. Um, that's not exactly what this is. Um, but we, we may or may not get to some no forgetting constraints. Yeah, okay, so directional differentiability is a standard thing. Every convex function satisfies that, right? So that's just, it is differentiable in a direction. That one is easy. Continuous is the key weasel word in there that got me something, right? Because it may not be like Frechet or Gateau differentiable, but it can still be directionally differentiable in every direction. And as long as that derivative is continuous as I change direction, then I can get my theorem to go through. Um, but it's the continuous there that's the key part. All right. But you still have finite dimensions, probably. You probably you just find it. Yeah, though that doesn't turn out to matter for anything. No, I am not mattering. It would be easy to check the convex function. Convex function has a lot of nice details. If it's would be, it's got to be almost always easy. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I don't think this is a huge assumption, <laughs> uh, but it is an assumption. All right. Um, it's a cost function is uniformly posterior separable. Remember, this thing was posterior separable. It's uniformly posterior separable if it's a special kind of, bre of divergence called a Bregman divergence. A Bregman divergence is made out of convex functions. So it's h of qa minus h of q minus the difference times the gradient, where h is a convex function. So this is a special class. Yeah? Entropy is like a distance function. Uh, mutual infer or Re Kolbeck Leibler is one, yeah, of these. It's one of these. Mutual information is one of these. We'll get there. Okay. Um, it's easy to think about something Yeah. I tend to start from the abstract, as you've seen. <laughs> um, so by Bayes consistency, what do I mean by Bayes consistency? Just expectations of posteriors is prior. Uh, we could just write our cost function as sum of the expected values of this convex function minus the original value. Recall convexity means this thing is going to be positive by Jensen's inequality. Uh, if you want to know why these things, you can see uh, my paper. I have a dynamic micro foundation for why you might want this. Uh, Frankel and Kamenitsa have a nice paper in the AER, which is sort of thinking about dynamics of beliefs and taking an axiomatic perspective. Kaplan, Dean, and Leahy have a characterization of these things from the set of these things that depends on a property called locally invariant posteriors that I will tell you about shortly. This axiom I actually do understand, so I will try to tell, teach you about it. Okay. So now we're going to start with a rational inattention problem with a posterior separable cost function, because everyone works with one of those. I have changed our choice variables. I've changed them to be the unconditional probabilities of the actions and the posteriors. Why did I make that change? Well, this thing is about posteriors. So everything is nice and clean if you use posteriors. Remember, we have a constraint of Bayes' consistency. The expectations of our posteriors has to be equal to the prior. Um, now I'm going to do a math trick. This is a, a, a math trick I think of my own invention, uh, but it will make life easy. This thing is a divergence that is defined on the probability simplex. But I want to extend it to the space of uh, measures. So the way I'm going to do that is with homogeneity of degree 1. So it's going to be homogeneous of degree 1 in its first argument. So if for some reason whatever we pass to it doesn't sum to 1, it's going to be the same thing as the thing on the simplex scaled by that scaling factor. That is going to allow me, under that assumption, to take my pi and my qa and kind of make them put them together. 
So q hat is going to be pi a times q a. And now I can write the problem as the maximization over the q hats, my expected utility, minus my divergence, subject to the constraint that the sum of the q hats has to equal the prior. Yeah, you can think about it as choosing the distribution of your posteriors. You can't choose your posterior because your posteriors have to average to your prior. But you can choose the distribution subject to the constraint of averaging to the prior. This thing, remember that this is convex in its first argument, is a lovely and well-behaved optimization problem with one caveat, which is that this homogeneity of degree one means that this thing is not strictly convex. It's only convex. And so we're going to be worried about multiple solutions and stuff like that. Uh, corner solutions, by and large, we are not going to worry about. Well, I, I, I take that back. There are two kinds of corners to think about here. One is the kind of corner where your posterior is on the edge of the simplex. The most popular cost functions are going to make that infinitely costly. Not going to worry about it. There's a second kind of corner where there's some actions that you don't do with positive probability. That's a major deal. So this corner, not we don't usually worry about this corner we worry about a lot um, okay but the KKT conditions remember concave thing we're maximizing linear constraints lovely uh, so the KKT conditions are necessary and sufficient but optimal policies are not necessarily unique uh, the Lagrangian version of this is uh, the same maximization, but now we have kappa. That's going to enforce our constraint on the adding up. And we have a bunch of new A's that keep us off the boundary of the simplex. Our first order condition is for all actions that we take with positive probability. Utility minus kappa. Maybe we have to keep off the edge, but we're not usually worrying about that, minus gradient of the cost function equals zero, vector zero. Multiplying by q hat and using that homogeneity of degree one, here's where the math trick is paying off, q hat utility minus kappa is equal to the original divergence. There I've used that homogeneity of degree one. And um, there's also a condition for the actions we never take, if we never take them, which is saying Q for any Q utility minus kappa has to be less than or equal to the divergence. Otherwise, we would take the action. And that must be for all Q. OK. Uh, specializing this to the uniformly posterior separable case, we get, instead of a divergence, just gradients of that h function. That makes things a little bit prettier. And now we're going to talk about that property, uh, locally invariant posteriors. Suppose we have solutions. Posteriors, given initial beliefs. Kappa, given initial beliefs. Then for any new prior, q0 prime, which is an affine combination of our posteriors with the original prior, we have that the priors, the posteriors remain the same with the new prior, and the kappa moves around. What is this saying? What it's saying is, take, suppose you had two actions and a ton of states. You take your posteriors with those two actions, posterior given action A, posterior given action B, everything on the line segment connecting those two posteriors 
if you solve the rational and intention problem at a new point, you'll get the same posteriors. Different probabilities, same posteriors. So this is called locally invariant posteriors. And what Kaplan, Dean, and Leahy show is that behaviorally, if an agent demonstrates in the data locally invariant posteriors, then they must have a UPS cost function, assuming that they have a posterior separable cost function. Okay. Consideration sets. So in this model, uh, for actions that occur with positive probability, the max of Q times utility minus kappa minus divergence equals zero. For actions that do not occur with positive probability, it can be less than or equal to zero. Consequently, you can immediately see from these two relations that if action A dominates action A prime, meaning it has higher utility in all states, A prime will never be chosen. So that's good. Makes sense. Um, when A is an infinite set, it turns out that often the set of actions that are chosen is finite, which is sort of interesting. Um, and then if you really want to learn a lot about consideration sets, Kaplan, Dean, and Leahy have a nice paper about it. Uh, I think that's forthcoming in Restud. Can you give us a little reason why is that true? Or is that too complex? Why is it that you only choose a finite number of actions? Uh, I mean, this paper <laughs> makes the argument with Fourier transforms. Basically, something has to go exactly right, right so that uh, in order to get. Bad. Yeah. It's, it's not an easy argument. OK. In reality, basically no one solves these full models. They solve special cases where life is much easier. The first special case is when there are two actions. Let's call them L and R. When there are two actions, I can just take the two forced order conditions and combine them. I can get rid of that kappa multiplier. And I can say, ah, utility minus gradient equals utility minus gradient. But then I can sub out for the q hat r because by using the adding up constraint. And now, provided d is strictly convex, which is our usual assumption, this equation pins down the answer. I'm done. And then you can define the consideration set under what circumstances will I always do L or always do R using the previous result that we've set, uh, established? Um, if you want to try to do this trick with more than two actions, it gets a little messy, but there is a paper that talks about how. Uh, okay, so let's see, how are we doing on time? Uh, 20 minutes, okay. All right, yeah. We're, we're almost through the horrible theory, and then we can do some finance. Uh, okay, so Sims, when he was introducing all of this, had a very particular C function in mind, which was called mutual information. So the kolbach leibler divergence, which is what mutual information is made from, is the sum, the expected value of the log of the ratio. It is a Bregman divergence that is associated with Shannon's entropy. The cost function is known as mutual information when it's made up of these kolbach leibler divergences. With mutual information, and this is special to mutual information, there is an alternative representation. Here I've written it as probability of action, kolbach leibler divergence between prior and posterior. With mutual information, you can also write it as probability of state, kolbach leibler divergence between unconditional probability of action and conditional probability of action. These two things are the same thing, but that's special to mutual information. Usually, we're going to throw a constant. We call that theta in there to just parameterize the cost of information. So what makes kolbach leibler special? Well, first off, very conveniently, if you tell me a state space, there is a kolbach leibler divergence, right? This one functional form can be applied to any problem, which is fantastically useful. However, it knows nothing about the meaning 
of the states. So there's no sense in which a pair of states x and x prime are closer together than x and x prime prime. In fact, the lack of any sense of this axiomatically defines kolbach leibler within the UPS cost functions. This leads to some strange behavior. In particular, and we'll see this later, it allows your beliefs, the probability of getting a particular signal, to jump at places where your payoff jumps, even if the two states seem very similar. And this creates problems when you take this cost function to experimental data. So there's a line of research about those problems and possible solutions. I have one alternative that I've proposed. These authors have a, a related alternative that they've proposed. Uh, these are not popular, I'm not going to lie. Um, I'd like them to be popular. Mutual information is popular. These things are never used. I think they should be, but um, I have yet to win that argument. Okay. So now let's use the kolbach leibler divergence. When we take our gradient and we take some particular element, it's just the ratio of the logs. kolbach leibler guarantees full support, so we don't need to worry about the boundaries of the simplex. So our first order condition is just utility minus multiplier is equal to theta times log of ratios. Consequently, I can just solve for things, and I end up concluding that the probability of taking an action conditional on a true state x is the logit model. So it's the expect exponential of the utility over the exponential of all the utilities of all the other actions summed up, and there's these weights pi. Mateka and McKay were the first to document this. Um, and so they argue that in many places where people have used logit models, like in I.O., you can give those things, instead of a random utility interpretation, a rational attention interpretation, which I think is quite interesting. Right? Usually in an I.O. model, you're trying to decide, are people going to buy Coke or Pepsi? It turns out you can't predict very well whether they like Coke or Pepsi. They seem to behave randomly. The traditional interpretation has been random utility shocks. Here, the interpretation is random mistakes, which is a little bit different. Um, all right. uh, the pies, by the way, don't really have explicit solutions in most cases. So you can solve for the logit thing conditional on the pies, but it's hard to solve for the pies explicitly. A computer can do it, no problem. Okay, so we covered binary choice. We showed you the logit thing. The last sort of special case that people do is linear quadratic Gaussian environments. So now we're going to suppose that the actions are just on the real line, and it's also the state space is the real line, and utility is quadratic. So in particular, let's suppose it's a tracking problem. You're trying to take the action that corresponds to the state and you have quadratic loss. Moreover, suppose with your prior, that your prior is Gaussian. A result is that with this KL divergence cost function, your optimal posteriors are also Gaussian, and it is equivalent to receiving a signal of the true state plus noise. For a standard normal distributed epsilon, and so consequently, you can take all this rational attention stuff and set it to the side and just pretend that you're choosing a precision or a, a, a variance of your, of your normally distributed signal. Um, I will point out that this is not uniquely a feature of kolbach leibler I will plug my own alternative proposal as, as also having this particular property in the linear quadratic Gaussian setting. Okay, so with LQG behavior, uh, agents optimally place some prior weight, weight on their prior mean, x bar, and signal s, and consequently they don't fully respond to the true x. Right? If you got only a noisy signal about x, 
you would mix that with your prior mean and you would sort of respond only part way depending on the signal to noise ratio depends on how much you do of each prior uncertainty uh, the more uncer uncertain your prior is amplifies this effect stronger incentives lead to more attention um, there are dynamic versions of this where at each step Gaussian updating is optimal and the point of this is that it leads to sluggish reactions your action drifts up slowly even if the state jumped quickly this sluggish reaction was sort of Sims's original motivation for rational inattention so in macro data we often see something like asset prices or something else jump but consumption slowly drifts up to the new equilibrium level Sims wanted to capture that and this is how he did it um, Koibin and Gorodnichenko are applying this idea they're saying well look if your beliefs are only slowly converging towards the new true state then I can predict how you will revise your beliefs that is for a, a fully rational agent future revisions and beliefs are never predictable because beliefs are martingales here an outsider who knows the truth can predict the revisions and beliefs um, and that's the, the the point of their empirical exercise which is they show that that's true about survey forecasts okay there are dynamic versions of rational intention everything I've shown you is static if you want to see a dynamic rational inattention problem where mutual information is the cost function Steiner Stewart and Mateka is the place to go if you want to see a dynamic problem with very general costs but where you only take an action once and then stop that's my paper um, the general version of this is it's just the same rational inattention problem but now I've slapped on some continuation values and the thing to notice is that the continuation value function is a function of your beliefs and value functions are almost always convex in beliefs why because you want to know it helps you make better decisions you would rather know this or that rather than some average consequently this provides an additional motivation for learning I might want to learn today not because it helps me make a better action today but because that learning will be helpful in the future it turns out under mutual information that that doesn't happen which is an interesting point in this paper you never study for the test in advance but that's special to mutual information uh, okay um, so somehow you've let me talk through an amazing amount of technical material in a relatively short amount of time uh, to summarize sort of what we've done so far uh, there are three major categories of rational and attention models binary choice where you can often get things in closed form linear quadratic Gaussian where it's you've reduced it to just choosing the noise on your signal and discrete choice where if you don't need to figure out those pies maybe you can still say something in your model yeah and I mean it's just there's no analytic solution but it's not it's a well-behaved problem it's just not one that you can solve by hand um, so the literature focuses on mutual information it's tractable and it often generates very nice kind of solutions we like discrete choice we like Gaussian updating in the binary case you can just solve everything by hand which is lovely uh, it does make some weird predictions which I will tell you about in, well I will show you okay. I guess I told you my, my goal is to show you in an application um, and there are alternatives or generalizations that are available for all three of those applications um, so this is where I had intended to stop um, I think given that we have 10 minutes left it is indeed a good idea to stop and go over the technical material um, if there are any further questions about that and then after the break 
we can talk about how to apply rational intention theory in finance. Okay, good, good, yes. Okay. Binary decisions. The key, let's, uh, let's go back even more. Remember, this is like our first order condition. The obnoxious thing is this kappa. It appears in all of the first order conditions for all of the actions, right? There's one of these for each A. But we don't know what the kappa is. But in the binary choice case, we can just move the kappa over here. And notice that we really have two equations for the two different actions. So we can just stick those equations with each other. And now if we're not worried about being on the boundary of the simplex, which I'm also going to ignore, that's what I meant by assuming interior solutions, now we have this nice little functional form. If we further specialize this to mutual information, we would get something even nicer, right? And that's how you get, you know, sort of a very, because that logit formula is very simple in the binary choice case. And there we could indeed solve for the pi if there were only two actions. Um, I should say, and we'll see a little bit of this, that even if there's only two actions, there's still a very interesting question about consideration sets. Because remember, this putting these two things together and writing this down assumed that we do both actions with positive probability. If we're not doing both actions with positive probability, we need to think about what the conditions for that are. And so uh, Mike Woodford has, I think, a 2009 paper and Ming Yang has a uh, 2018 paper where they sort of solve out for these kind of things. In Ming's example, it's do I buy something? There's a chance that I'm going to acquire information and then decide buy or not buy with some probability. That's this first order condition. There's a chance that I always buy it without acquiring information. Under my prior, it's such a good deal that there's no reason for me to learn. There's a, also a chance that under my prior, it's such a bad deal that I'm not going to spend the effort to try to learn. I'm just going to say no. So that's what we mean by the consideration set here, is do I consider buying or not buying, in which case I gather information, or do I know sort of already what I want to do? Gathering information is likely to just be a waste. I'm just going to do whatever's best under my prior. OK. so. Sorry, say, say the second thing, search model or what? Bandit. Bandit problem. Uh, yes, with the bandit problem. The search, if you mean by like a DMP style search, I don't know. A lot of versions of search you can write in terms of the bandit Yeah, yeah. So I think the answer is yes, and that's a bit of sort of like what I've done in one of my papers, but it, I, it's not formal, so I don't want to say yes. But I think the answer is quite possibly. One thing that I'm currently working on, which is related to that, you may know that in psychology, there's uh, drift diffusion or DDM models, which are very popular. I think that there is a very close connection between DDM models and these binary choice rational and attention models. And so that's something that I'm working on with Mike Woodford right now. Um, yeah? I have a question on how this relates to communication arguments. Because I was thinking, so if I have a radio function and then I have all these nice tiers of a real cross function, that I could just uh, subtract the two from each other and then I could get like the tiers that I want to buy in some sense or the distribution that I want to buy from. Um, Yes, yeah, so um, uh, Jenskow and Kamenitsa in the uh, sort of uh, literature on, uh, oh God, what is it called? Um, Bayesian persuasion. Bayesian persuasion, thank you. Um, 
talk about concavification, and that is indeed one way of solving these binary choice models, is that you can define what they call the, uh, uh, go back, uh, the net utility function, which is the utility minus this H function. And then the solution to the binary choice case is the concavification of the net utility function. Um, as far as I know, no one has been able to make that argument work outside of the binary choice case. And you can also just solve the binary choice case algebraically. So I don't emphasize the concavification because I haven't quite figured out where that perspective is useful. But it is a valid perspective. Uh, and it's equivalent to what we're doing. More questions? You're on? So it's more like, I yeah, was thinking about the Gebex Lakeland uh, findings of people forgetting about carpets with, say, solar and solar. Um, do you have a sense of what the That's an interesting question. I mean, it's, it's hard. Uh, so what Euron is referring to is uh, a paper by Gebex and Leibson about shrouding, which is the idea that people fail to anticipate sort of needing complementary items. So you buy a printer, you forget that there's a huge markup on the cartridges. You go to the movies, you forget that they charge crazy prices for the food. You know, you go to the hotel, you want to drink, you forget that the mini bar is crazy expensive, that kind of thing. I have not seen it worked out formally how to think about that in rational and attention terms. Because you would think that at some point people would update their priors to understand that even though they don't know the price of this particular printer's cartridges, the prices are likely to be high. Now, you can embed rational and inattentive consumers into a market where people are selling things. And there the idea is that you try to sort of introduce costs that are harder to observe. However, in equilibrium, this doesn't work out because people update their priors. So Mateka and McKay have a nice paper about that. I think it's closely related to shrouding, but I don't want to say that it's exactly the same. In terms of calibrating the information costs, who knows? Um, there aren't too many, you know, uh, what there, what I think Yaron is referring to is that theta parameter, like on the callback lively divergence, like how big is it? People have calibrated, like in the survey forecasts, like Koibin and Gorodnichenko, they have calibrated sort of how smoothly beliefs move to the new level, the inertia in beliefs, to get thetas. But um, obviously it's probably going to be context dependent. I think there's no reason for it to be like a universal parameter. Um, but then what's the theory for the context? I don't think there. So in general, some decisions might be harder than others. So if you think about, remember that Kaplan-Dean experiment I told you about with the red and blue balls on the screen? I said 4951. If there was either 90 red and 10 blue, or, or 10 red and 90 blue, it would be an easy problem. Everyone would get it right most of the time. The fact that it's 49.51 is what makes it hard. So if you think about how to think about that in a mutual infer in a rational and attention context, you need to change the theta. Because you need to say that this decision is hard and that decision is easy. But of course, that illustrates right there why it can't be a universal parameter. Some problems are hard and some problems are easy. I think you could. I am not aware of anyone who has done that. I mean, I think the aim of rational intention is to be a universal theory of all 
behavioral phenomena. Um, so I think it's. So I think it is fair game to say, can I explain this behavioral phenomena with rational inattention? But I don't think that the rich set of behavioral phenomena that has been documented has been fully explored in terms of whether it can be explained with rational inattention or not. So it's ambitious, the, the whole program, and I think the question is, is there really this unifying explanation or not? Yeah, so uh, there's a very nice uh, job market paper this year by Wei Ji Zong from Columbia who shows in a dynamic rational and attention model, uh, sort of like my paper with Mike, that um, under certain set circumstances, it's optimal to have beliefs that jump. So in, in my paper with Mike, we mostly focus on beliefs that are diffusions. But it turns out that the optimal continuous time process might be more like a jump process for beliefs than a diffusion process for beliefs. Now, whether you want to associate that with paradigm shifts or not, I don't know. But uh, there, is, there are things that are known about whether it is optimal to search out for rare but extremely informative signals versus common but less informative possibilities. Okay, so that's, uh, I think, where we should stop for the moment. And uh, I promise we will talk about some finance after the break.